Good day and welcome to Big Bad Tech. I'm your instructor, Jim Pytel. Today's topic of discussion is current sources. Our objective today is to introduce the current source and perform circuit analysis using current sources. Additionally, we'll discuss rules and regulations regarding current sources and the limitations of real-world current sources. Recall at the end of the current divider lecture, available at the Big Bad Tech channel, I introduced an adjustable voltage source that would increase or decrease its output voltage in order to keep current at some preset constant value. This is a real-world current source. We'll return to this definition in a moment, but first let me introduce the mathematically perfect entity known as a current source. This is the schematic symbol for a current source. It is a two-terminal device and induces conventional current through a circuit in the direction indicated by the arrow. This is a mathematically perfect entity and not necessarily constrained by reality. In theory, a two amp current source would push two amps of current through a 20 ohm resistor as easily as it would a 20 mega ohm resistor, but the real world says differently. We'll discuss limitations of real world current sources in a moment, but for now, we'll just assume the current source behaves exactly like it's supposed to. Regardless of the applied load, the current source pushes the required amount of current through a circuit in the indicated direction. You'll be happy to know if you keep current sources at this level of abstraction, circuit analysis is exceptionally easy. When a current source pushes two amps of current through a 20 ohm resistor, what is the voltage drop across it? Ohm's law states that voltage is equal to current times resistance. Substituting in the necessary values, we find the voltage drop to be 40 volts. When the load resistor is swapped out with a 20 mega ohm resistor, what is the voltage drop across it? Ohm's law again states that voltage is equal to current times resistance. Substituting in the necessary values, we find the voltage drop to be 40 megavolts. Can you see the difficulty in purchasing a current source that will push two amps through a circuit regardless of applied load? It is not going to happen. However, if we suspend our disbelief in physics, sure, it could happen, and our Ohm's law analysis gives us the necessary proof that it could. The current divider rule is an especially handy technique when performing circuit analysis using current sources. For reasons I'll explain later in the source conversion and Norton's theorem lecture, current sources are often placed in parallel with a fixed resistor and a variable load resistor. This is a perfect setup for the current divider rule. Incoming current is known, as are the resistor values. Here's a current source supplying 290 milliampers to a parallel combination of a fixed 4.7 kilo ohm resistor and a variable load resistor set to 240 ohms. Pause the lecture and apply the CDR to solve for the current through each element IF and IL. Once you've got this information, solve for the voltage drop across each element. The CDR states that the current through the one I'm interested in is equal to the resistance of the one I'm not interested in divided by the summation of these two resistors times the incoming current. To solve for IL, the current through RL, RL is our resistor of interest. RF is our resistor not of interest. RF goes in the numerator position. The denominator is the summation of both resistors, the one I'm interested in, RL, plus the one I'm not interested in, RF. Finally, the incoming current for this parallel combination is the magnitude of the current source. The CDR set up to solve for IL is as follows. IL equals RF divided by RL plus RF times I in. Substituting in the necessary values, we find IL to be approximately 275.9 milliampers. Knowing 275.9 milliampers of the incoming 290 milliampers went through the adjustable load resistor RL, we can use Kirchhoff's current law to solve for current through the fixed resistor IF being the remainder, where IN equals IF plus IL. Solving for IF and substituting in the necessary values, we find IF to be approximately 14.1 milliampers. Less current is going through the larger fixed resistor. More current is going through the smaller variable resistor. The summation of both outgoing currents equals the incoming current. We can be reasonably certain our results are correct. To solve for voltage across each resistor, we can use Ohm's law, where VL equals IL times RL. Substituting in the necessary values, we find VL equals approximately 66.2 volts. Since RF is in parallel with RL, it can be said, no calculations needed, 
that the voltage across it is also approximately 66.2 volts. Since the voltage drop across this parallel combination of two resistors is 66.2 volts, we can use Kirchhoff's voltage law to demonstrate that this voltage drop must be caused by an equal and opposite voltage rise of 66.2 volts produced by the current source. Now let's say our variable load resistor changed to 690 ohms. Pause the lecture and use similar techniques to solve for the current through each element and the voltage drop across each element. The CDR set up to solve for IL is RF divided by RL plus RF times I in, substituting in the necessary values. We find IL to be approximately 252.9 milliampers. Knowing 252.9 milliampers of the incoming 290 milliampers went through the adjustable load resistor RL, we can use Kirchhoff's current law to solve for current through the fixed resistor being the remainder, where IN equals IF plus IL, and solving for IF, and substituting in the necessary values, we find IF equals approximately 37.1 milliampers. Less current is going through the larger fixed resistor, more current is going through the smaller variable resistor. The summation of both outgoing currents equals the incoming current. We can be reasonably certain our results are correct. To solve for voltage across each resistor, we can use Ohm's law, where VL equals IL times RL, Substituting in the necessary values, we find VL equals approximately 174.5 volts. Since RF is in parallel with RL, it can be said, no calculations needed, that the voltage across it is also approximately 174.5 volts. If the voltage drop across this parallel combination of two resistors is 174.5 volts, we can use Kirchhoff's voltage law to demonstrate that this drop must be caused by an equal and opposite voltage rise of 174.5 volts produced by the current source. Notice the voltage across this parallel combination is much higher than our previous combination because the parallel combination of a 4.7 kilo ohm resistor and a 690 ohm resistor at approximately 601.7 ohms presents far more resistance than the parallel combination of a 4.7 kilo ohm resistor and a 240 ohm resistor at approximately 228.3 ohms. It makes sense. This increased voltage is necessary to continually deliver 290 milliampers to a circuit with increased total resistance. Is it just me, or does circuit analysis with current sources seem suspiciously easy? Do you suspect a trap? Chill out, relax for once. I know I've been hammering you with some pretty long detailed lectures lately, but this is the one occasion where it really is this simple. If you've got a solid understanding of Ohm's law, you can make use of the CDR shortcut. It really is this easy. Keep in mind that current sources aren't exclusively limited to just pure parallel circuit analysis. They can be included in basic series circuits or more advanced series parallel circuits. Consider this illustrated example of a 40 milliampere current source placed in series with a 330, a 270, and a 510 ohm resistor. This is a totally different ball game than our previous parallel circuits, but well within the reach of those individuals with an understanding of basic series circuit properties and Ohm's law. The most fundamental property of series circuits is that current through elements in a series relationship is the same. This current source, being the only active source in our circuit, must therefore induce 40 milliampers of current through the whole circuit. IS equals I1 equals I2 equals I3. Pause the lecture and solve for the voltage drop across each resistor and consider the necessary voltage rise that must be present to induce this voltage drop. Ohm's law states that the voltage drop across an element is the current through it times its resistance. Solving for V1, we find V1 equals I1 times R1. Substituting in the necessary values, we find V1 to be 13.2 volts. V2 equals I2 times R2. Substituting in the necessary values, we find V2 to be 10.8 volts. Solving for V3, we find V3 equals I3 times R3. Substituting in the necessary values, we find V3 to be 20.4 volts. Using Kirchhoff's voltage law can be said that the sum of voltage drops equals the voltage rise. The voltage rise induced by this current source must therefore be equal to V1 plus V2 plus V3. Substituting in the necessary values, 
we find this current source must have a voltage rise of 44.4 volts to induce 40 milliampers of current through this series combination of three resistors. See, it really is this easy. And that's the point. A current source is a mathematically pure entity and allows us to make these simplifications. If you've got a current source, you can either whip out Ohm's law or a CDR, and the hardest of circuit analysis problems will just fold like an origami ballerina. We'll learn in later lectures that one can swap out a voltage source in series with a resistor with an equivalent current source in parallel with a resistor. But today's lecture is just a quick introduction to this mathematically pure entity. As easy as current sources seem to be, they do come with some strings attached. The most important strings being that current sources cannot violate basic series and parallel properties, nor establish laws like Kirchhoff's voltage law or Kirchhoff's current law. Here are two rules and regulations regarding current sources. Rule one, current sources of different magnitudes are never placed in series with one another. This doesn't make sense. If source one was pushing 30 milliampers through a circuit regardless of the applied load, and source two is pushing 50 milliampers through the same circuit regardless of the applied load, this wouldn't work out so well because current through elements in series is the same. The last time I checked, 30 doesn't equal 50, nor does 50 equal 30. This being said, current sources of different magnitudes can be placed in parallel with one another. If source one was pushing 30 milliampers up through this circuit, and source two is pushing 50 milliampers up through this circuit, What's the total current delivered to this circuit? The answer, via Kirchhoff's current law, is 30 plus 50, or 80 milliampers. That makes sense. Now, here's where reality steps in. What's the voltage across source one, and what's the voltage across source two? Don't think too hard, though, because I hate for your head to explode. If voltage across elements in parallel is the same, we must necessarily make a simplification of our simplification. Rule two, current sources in parallel add up, taking into account polarity. With both sources pointing up, there is now a single 80 milliampere current source, delivering 80 milliampers to the top node of our circuit. If the 30 milliampere source was pointing downwards, this parallel combination of two opposing current sources would only be delivering 20 milliampers of current to the top node of our circuit. In this parallel aiding configuration, it can be simplified as a single 80 milliampere current source. If our load resistor is 390 ohms, via Ohm's law, the voltage across it would be 31.2 volts. Before we bring this short lecture to a close, let us pause to consider the means of operation and limitations of a real world current source. As I mentioned at the end of the current divider rule, if you crack open a current source, what you'll really find is an adjustable voltage source that's continually monitoring and maintaining output current at some constant value. The means of doing this is via a closed loop controller, one of the most basic elements of control theory. A closed loop controller requires two basic inputs. One, some desired set point established by an operator. In this case, it's the output current of 80 milliampers. Two, it must monitor the actual output of the system. In this case, an ammeter could be used to measure actual current produced by the source. The controller continually compares the desired set point with the actual output of the system. If there is a difference between the desired output and the actual output, there is an error. And the magnitude and sign of this error represents by how much the system must increase or decrease its output to achieve the desired set point. Consider the inner workings of the current source supplying 80 milliampers to a 390 ohm load resistor. The desired output is 80 milliampers. The actual output is 80 milliampers. The error is zero milliampers and the adjustable voltage supply continues to supply our previously calculated 31.2 volts sufficient to push 80 milliampers through a 390 ohm load resistor. If the load resistor changed to 470 volts, our current output voltage of 31.2 volts would only push approximately 66.4 milliampers of current through it. Via the feedback loop, the current source realizes there is an error in this case of positive 13.6 milliampers. 
Because of the sign associated with the summing junction, the current source realizes that the set point is higher than the output, and it must increase its output by 13.6 milliampers. Via the transfer function, a bit of control theory math I'm skipping over right now, that for this circuit is kind of just like Ohm's law in a nice suit and tie, the adjustable voltage source increases its output, in this case to 37.6 volts. At this voltage level, current is again 80 milliampers and the error is 0 milliampers. Does this readjustment happen instantly? No. There is some appreciable rise time and there is some overshoot and settling time. We'll learn in much later lectures the dirty details and secret tricks of control theory, but for now, consider this the most basic of introductions. Two more quick examples though and our brief tour will be complete. Let's say the load resistor dropped 180 ohms. At its present output level of 37.6 volts, the source would actually be delivering approximately 208.9 milliampers of current. This is clearly in excess of the desired 80 milliampere set point. The error in this case is negative 128.9 milliampers. Again, note the negative sign. The error output is saying, whoa, take a log off that fire. In this case, the output voltage needs to drop to 14.4 volts. And once the output voltage settles to 14.4 volts, the source is again actually producing 80 milliampers and the error between the actual output and the desired set point is 0 milliampers. Finally, the load resistor is dramatically raised to 2 kilo ohms. At its present level of 14.4 volts, this source would only be actually delivering approximately 7.2 milliampers of current. This is way below our desired 80 milliampere set point. The error in this case is positive 72.8 milliampers. Again, note the positive sign and the large amount of error. The error output is saying hit the gas and hit it hard. The output voltage rises and rises, but at some point a real world current source, in contrast to our mathematically perfect entities, is just going to run out of gas. Via Ohm's law, ordinarily an output voltage of 160 volts would be required to push 80 milliampers of current through a 2 kilo ohm resistor. But let's say the adjustable voltage source inside this real world current source tops out at 120 volts. An output of 120 volts supplying a 2 kilo ohm resistor only delivers 60 milliampers of current. In this case, there is still a positive 20 milliampere error between the desired set point and the actual output, but the real world has hard limits that real devices just can't surmount. Long story short, if you're using a benchtop power supply as a current source, know its operational range and simply operate inside that range. Inside the operational range, the current source should push the required current through whatever you throw at it. Outside the operational range, expect to reach some peak output followed by a predictable decline. Okay, I think we've delivered a sufficient introduction to the current source. Keep in mind we'll be seeing the current source again in later circuit analysis situations, as well as making use of a handy equivalency between current sources and voltage sources called source conversion. The current source also takes a leading role in something called Norton's theorem. Remember to never place current sources of different magnitudes in series with one another, and that current sources in parallel add up taking into account polarity. Stay on the right side of Kirchhoff's laws. Believe me, the judgments are swift and the punishments are harsh. In conclusion, this lecture presented the current source and performed illustrated circuit analysis examples using current sources. Additionally, we discussed two rules regarding current sources in series and in parallel. Finally, it presented the inner workings of a real current source and discussed their real-world limits. Remember to review this material as often as you need to really drive it home. Imagine how well lab will go if you know what you're doing. Thank you very much for your attention and interest, and we'll see you again during the next lecture of our series. Remember to tell your lazy lab partner about this resource, and be sure to check out the Big Bad Tech channel for additional resources and updates.